thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to chair the final session uh, of this conference. Um, so my name is Sajith Kapadia, and I'm joined here by, um, by Stefan Nagel, by Falk Mazelis, by Amy Hanlon, and by um, Alexander Kolas, who will be um, presenting papers and discussing papers in this session. I think the themes of this session really link very well to some of the topics that have been discussed previously in the conference, in particular around dynamics around inflation expectations and what that implies for the long run, and around monetary policy communication, um, which will be discussed in the second paper. But let me um, give maximum time to the, to the speakers and discussants. So let me start by introducing Stefan Nagel, who is um, at uh, University of Chicago Booth, who will present the first paper in the session, which is Leaning Against Inflation Experiences. Thanks very much. OK, uh, thanks a lot for having me at this uh, wonderful conference. Um, the paper I want to talk about today is trying to understand uh, the, what you see plotted here in this chart, which is a series of real interest rates, uh, in this case over a five-year horizon, uh, plotted from the uh, early 1960s until very recently. And what I'm trying to understand in particular is not so much these shorter run wiggles in this series, but these slow-moving secular changes that we saw in real interest rates, the rise you know, into the 1980s and then the four-decade uh, decline in those rates until very recently. And uh, what I'm going to argue, in short, is that maybe monetary policy has a little bit more to do with these secular changes uh, than is commonly taught. Now, if you look at you know, standard explanations of why we see secular changes in real interest rates, um, the typical explanation is, well, this is probably due to changes in the natural rate of interest. And the red line you see here is a very often used uh, series of R star of the natural rate of interest. This is the Laubach Williams uh, R star measure that you can download from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, website. And you can see, even though these series, you know, these series seem to share a trend, maybe, but uh, there's still a lot of stuff unexplained, even if you abstract from the shorter run wiggles and you focus on slow moving secular changes. And so the story I'm going to tell you today about what can be contributing to these slow moving changes in real interest rates has three elements. Uh, the first element is I'm going to think about a world in which people form expectations about inflation in the long run, uh, not by listening to the words of central bankers, what they say to about their you know, target for inflation, but instead these inflation expectations are going to be formed based on experiences that people have in the past. Yeah? So this is the first element. And this, the one consequence of this will be that these expectations are in some sense very sticky. They're going to change very slowly. The second one is when these inflation expectations deviate from where policymakers would like them to be, policymakers are going to lean against those with monetary policy. And this is going to lead to a very persistent real interest rate effect. And then the third one, this is a little bit more nebulous at this point, but I hope I can make this more clear later, is that when real interest rates change in response to you know, policymakers' actions, then agents are going to perceive these real interest rate changes as basically permanent. And so as a consequence, it's not only going to be the short-term real rate that will be affected, but it will be the whole term structure of real rates that is going to move around. All right, so this is all the elements of the story, and uh, here's how I'm going to go about uh, showing this. So the first part is going to look at, of my presentation, is going to look at the formation of inflation expectations, and I'm going to draw on work that I have done in the past years with Ulrike Marmadir, and I'm going to show you an update of this, and this is going to form the basis of what follows. Yeah? In the second part, I'm now going to look at a simple model uh, where we're going to ask what's, what's going to happen to the market economy and to interest rates, if people form inflation expectations in this way, yeah? uh, in, the, in the way that I explained in the first part. And then the third, third part will be uh, to show you empirical evidence that real interest rate behavior uh, over these you know, last six decades or so is actually consistent uh, with that model. Um, I will, will, will concentrate on evidence from the US, but if there's a few minutes of time, I can also show you some evidence from Germany, UK, and Japan. All right, so let's go to the first part inflation expectations formation. So I want to go back to my earlier work with Ulrike, and I want to show you uh, updated results on this. So the starting point uh, in our earlier work was that we, we uh, 
we, we, we propose a perceived law of motion that people may have in mind when they think about forecasting inflation. And we basically wanted to have a model that, that focuses on, on, on two, two key elements. One is people form an opinion about what the long run mean is of inflation, and people will form an opinion about what the persistence of inflation shocks is. And we can capture this with a perceived law of motion uh, that's an AR1. And what people are doing is, uh, in our model is they look at past data that they have seen on inflation rates to try to infer what the parameters are of this law of motion. So what is this A parameter and what is this row parameter? Okay. And uh, every, the learning takes place at a cohort level um, where every cohort uh, born at time S uses the most recent data on inflation rates to update the, the opinions basically about what these parameters are of the AR1. And they do this by run, running least squares regressions. And what the equations you see there are basically just recursive forms of writing, an, or, or, of writing a least squares uh, uh, estimator, where the estimates that people had in the previous period get updated in the response to an inflation surprise. You can see this is the current inflation rate minus the fitted value from the previous period. So this was the forecast from the previous period. So this whole thing in parentheses is a surprise. Yeah, this is just a standard recursive updating form of a least squares estimator. Uh, and the key uh, thing in our framework is the specification of this gain here. So this, this fee here controls how strongly do people react to the surprise? Do they react very strong? Do they change their updates a lot or very little? Yeah. And the way we specify this gain brings in what we call learning from experience, where people focus on their lifetime experiences in order to estimate these parameters of that process. And as a consequence, young people are going to react more to an incoming inflation uh, observation than older people do. Yeah? Now, how does, it, how does it come into the gain here? Well, if you look at the specification of the gain here, it's some parameter theta over age. So age is basically the lifetime data set size for an older person that's really bigger than for a young person. And if people were to run an OLS regression just in their lifetime data set, then the gain would be one over H. This would be just the, then the standard way of re representing OLS regression. Uh, empirically, we estimate that this theta is bigger than one. It's about three, which implies that people also downweight data from the distant past in their own lifetimes. Yeah, so they, they put a bit more weight on recent years in their lifetime data set than early on. Yeah? And this one down here just means that early age, you basically f forget everything, uh, and you only really start learning uh, after a couple of years. All right, so this is the framework. And uh, now let me show you what, uh, how, this, how this fits the data. So I'm going to go to the Michigan Survey of Consumers uh, all the way back to the 1950s. I'm going to feed quarterly CPI inflation into this updating scheme for every cohort at every point in time. And then I'm going to ask these expectations that come out of this framework, how well are they fitting uh, the Michigan survey data? Okay. So I take these estimates that every cohort has at every point in time, uh, given some, some value for this parameter theta. I construct a forecast by applying it to the most recent inflation data. And this tau is basically the, what we call the learning from experience or the experience-based forecast. And then I want to know how well does this explain the actual observed expectation state in the Michigan Survey of Consumers, which is here on the left-hand side. Yeah? So how well do these towers explain the actual observed expectations? Let me show you this uh, graphically, how this looks like. Um, so focus first on these dots, not yet on the lines in this chart. Um, the dots show you the Michigan Survey uh, expectations data for three, just for the purpose of this chart, separated into three different age groups. The uh, black dots are younger people below age 40. The red ones are middle-aged people. And the blue ones are people above the age 80, so uh, above the age 60, so older people. Yeah. And if you now look through the history here, uh, and er everything is plotted relative to the cross-sectional mean. So when you see one group showing up with, an with a value above zero, this means these are people that have above average inflation expectations at that point in time. Those below zero have below average inflation expectations. Yeah? So we're looking at a cross-sectional dispersion between these age groups. And so if you look through the history here, you know, in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't much action in inflation. 
And there also wasn't much dispersion in the views about future inflation of young and old. But as you see in the 70s then, when high inflation rates came in, we see young people diverging from old people. And by 1981, younger people had about three percentage points higher inflation expectations than older people. And then it took until the mid 90s for this gap to close. And then it flipped around. So in the past, in the 20 years before the recent burst of inflation, it was actually older people that had higher inflation expectations than younger people. Consistent with this idea that people learn from lifetime experience, right? It was the older people that still had the memories of the 70s that younger people didn't have. And then this is hard to see now, but very recently it has actually flipped around. So in the most recent data, it's again the younger people that have high inflation expectations than older people. Yeah, they seem to be more influenced more strongly by what has just recently seen in the past couple of years. All right, so this is uh, the raw data. And the dashed line here is just uh, basically the end of the sample period in our original paper. And what's to the right of it is uh, the out of sample period. And the lines show you the fitted value from this learning scheme that I just outlined on the previous slides. Yeah? So you can see it's not perfect, but it goes a long way in explaining why, for example, young and old disagreed so much in the early 1980s. Right? Younger people were more influenced more strongly by the 70s inflation than older people. And then why it took so long for this gap to close, and then also why it flipped around in the 20 years before the recent burst of inflation. Um, and this also continues in the, into the out of sample period. Yeah? OK, so summary, there's a lot of evidence that the way people form inflation expectations is tied to their lifetime experiences, and that this simple learning model that I outlined actually does a pretty good job uh, in capturing that. All right, so this was the first uh, part. Uh, but now I want to take this kind of expectations formation scheme, and I want to go and ask macro and asset pricing questions with it. Um, and to do so, I want to make two simplifications. So the first one is, you know, while this cross-section heterogeneity that you saw in the previous chart is very useful for identifying these experience effects, it's sort of a complication with regards to asking macro questions that we have all this heterogeneity. So I'm going to abstract from the heterogeneity, and I'm going to instead focus on what are the dynamics of the average belief average across young and old when people form expectations in this way, right? How, how, how does the average belief behave? Um, so that's one simplification. And the second one is I'm going to focus on long-term inflation expectations. So I'm going to ignore short-run dynamics, issues of you know, persist, short-term persistence of inflation shocks and so on, and just focusing on the long-term and focusing on secular changes instead of you know, business cycle dynamics. All right. Now, this actually simplifies things a lot, because uh, what we already showed in our earlier paper is that the dynamics of the average belief actually become very simple. They are very well approximated by a constant gain learning scheme. Now, why constant gain? Well, in our framework, young people always learn with high gain, older people with low gain. But on average, you know that's always young and old, so you basically get, an, uh, on average, a constant gain, basically. And then when we now focus on the long-term inflation expectations, it gets even more simple because now we, we don't have to update about an AR1 you know, persistence parameter. It's all just about the long-run mean. And so the constant gain updating for the long-term mean becomes very simple. It's basically just taking the current inflation rate and forming a weighted average with the previous estimate of this, of this mean. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing that we have all this micro data estimation that we did earlier is that we can actually pin down what this fee parameter is in this weighting scheme. So if you want to have a constant gain scheme that approximates very well the dynamics of the average belief in our framework, and in a way that matches the Michigan survey data, uh, you want to have a gain of 1.6% per quarter. And so in everything I'm going to show you today, I'm going to fix the, updating, the, the gain in this updating scheme to 1.6% per quarter which is quite important because this is going to play a big role in, in you know, how are the dynamics of these inflation expectations going to look like. If I were to make this gain much bigger, they would be much, moving much more quickly. Um, and so I'm going to tie my hands to this value, basically. And I'm not going to try to tweak this to better fit real interest rates. But instead, I'm going to tie my hands to this value. 
All right, so this was the first part. And now I want to look at if people form inflation expectations in this way about long run inflation, what would happen to real interest rates in a very simple new Keynesian model? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, some of very familiar looking um, log linearized equations with uh, some little tweaks, as you will see. Okay, so the first one is what we already discussed, which is the expectations formation, right? This is just this constant gain updating scheme for how people form opinions about long run inflation. Uh, there's a Phillips curve where these inflation expectations, you know, feed into current infl inflation. Um, and this U, which, which you can, you know, interpret as cost push shocks, I make it very simple. They're just going to be IID shocks. So there's no interesting short run persistence or business cycle dynamics or anything of that sort. It's just really these long term inflation expectations are going to move around and there's going to be some IID shocks on top of that. Yeah, that's all. There's an oil equation. Uh, but it's going to be a discounted oil equation. Uh, so people have in the past years developed these discounted oil equations in response to the forward guidance puzzle. And this is also useful in my model because the way people think about the future uh, will induce variations in real interest rates, not only in the short run, but also very long term real yields are going to move around a lot. And if I didn't have this discounting in the oil equation, you would get a lot of output movements that would be totally counterfactual. And so for the same reasons as, as you know, to avoid the forward guidance puzzle, you need this discounting, you also need the standard framework. So this is also another tweak to the standard framework uh, that I'm using. And then finally, the last piece is a monetary policy rule, where the monetary policy maker chooses a nominal interest rate uh, that basically leans against these uh, long-term inflation expectations. So you can think of this as a forward-looking rule where the monetary policymaker looks at, you know, what are people's opinions about future inflation and the policymaker worries about those because those are going to feed into uh, current inflation through the Phillips curve. All right. Let me, let me show you uh, what comes out. We don't have to walk in, in detail through all of the equations. I basically just want to show you that these long-term inflation expectations are going to show up everywhere now. So for example, uh, inflation is going to through the Phillips curve mechanism depend on these inflation expectations, right? It's quite natural. Um, the ex ante real interest rate under subjective expectations about inflation is also going to depend on this. Why? Because the policymaker is going to lean against those with nominal interest rates, right? They, 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 when these inflation expectations are elevated, the only way monetary policy can get rid of those is by bringing nominal in interest rates uh, quite a bit higher in order to induce lower realized inflation that will eventually make its way into expectations about future inflation. Yeah. Okay. And so there will be a positive dependence on these long-term inflation expectations of real interest rates and also forward rates. So if you look at a, a for, real forward rate at some point in the future, that one is also going to move positively with these long-term inflation expectations. And uh, in fact, it's going to be basically a parallel shift in the yield curve. Uh, not only short term, but also long term inflation expectations are going to move. Uh, let me show you this in a, in a kind of stylized you know, example, feeding some shocks into the system. Um, the black dashed line here is a bunch of cost push shocks that I feed into the system. You can think of this like the 1970s, sort of in a, in a, in a stylized way. At some point, you know, they subside. But now it's interesting to see what happens to the other things that are in the model, right? So, it, these cost push shocks generate inflation, but now you can see inflation actually starts going up a bit more than what's just induced by these cost push shocks. Why is that? Well, because every realization of high inflation is going to start to feed into the yellow line here, which is the subjective expectations about long run inflation, right? Every one more inflation realization is going to push long term inflation expectations a little bit higher. So long term inflation expectations are going up. And at some point, you know, monetary policy is going to start bringing inflation down, but this will take a long time until it makes it into these long run inflation expectations because people, you know, don't suddenly reset their expectations. They have to be convinced that long term inflation is going to be low by seeing many observations of low realized inflation. Yeah. And so here, the yellow line is the same. You can see again the subjective expectations about long run inflation. But now together with the blue line, which is the subjective real interest rates. Yeah. 
So because monetary policy makers are leaning against long-term inflation expectations, real interest rates are, will have to go up with long-term inflation expectations in order to induce low output, you know, slowing economy, uh, low inflation, that will eventually help bring those inflation expectations back down. And this is now the key thing that I'm gonna look for in the data. So is there a positive relationship between long-term inflation expectations and the subjective real interest rate? All right, so let me show you some uh, data on this. So here's the, the data I'm gonna look at. Uh, this is at a one-year horizon, various versions of real interest rates. The um, black dashed line is an exposed real rate, just taking nominal treasury yields, subtracting realized inflation. Uh, and then the blue and red are ex ante real rates. The red line is for households with Michigan survey expectations. The blue line is for professional forecasters from the survey of professional forecasters. Yeah. Um, and what I'm trying to understand is, you know, wh whether I can explain the rise and then the slow decline of these, these rates with a measure of perceived long-run inflation that comes out of this learning from experience model, which is the black, dash, uh, the black solid line here. I'm also gonna look at a term structure, so not just short-term real rates, but also long-term real rates. And so here you see one-year, five-year, 30-year uh, real rates um, relative to household expectations of inflation. And there's really one stunning and hard to explain thing that's going on in the early 1980s, which is in 1981, it wasn't just the case that short-term real rates were high, it was the entire term structure of real rates that was elevated. Yeah? And my model basically has a, a, a mechanism by which this happens. Yeah? Um, all right, so let's, let's, let's have a look at the empirical evidence on this. So what I'm interested in is sort of estimating something like the equation that you see there, which is put a real interest rate on the left-hand side, and then put a measure of these experience-based long-term inflation expectations on the right-hand side, and then see whether the, the, these inflation expectations explain real interest rates. Okay. Now, you can, from the charts that I showed you just a minute ago, you can see there's a econometric problem with this, which is there's a lot of persistence in the series. There could be unit roots, but we are not sure whether they are there. There could be co-integration, but maybe not, right? We don't really know. And so what I'm uh, gonna show, what I'm showing in the paper are some OLS regressions for descriptive purposes, but the main analysis is based on um, an approach, uh, inference approach with unknown order of integration, where I estimate basically this beta coefficient as the long run coefficients in an error correction model. And then there's a test by Pissar and Shin and Smith that allows you to test under conditions of not knowing the order of integration, um, whether there is indeed a long-run relationship between the real rates and these long-term inflation uh, expectations that I have on the right-hand side. And so I'm gonna, gonna show you now lots of evidence basically on this estimated beta parameter that comes from the error correction model. Okay. Um, so here's one example. This is at a three-month horizon using exposed real rates. Let's focus on column two. You can see OLS here coefficient of 1.3 on these long-term inflation expectations, and then also using the Lauer williams natural rate as a control or as an additional explanatory variable, it gets a coefficient of around one, which is sort of reasonable. And down here, you see the error correction model estimates, and they're actually not that different from the OLS in this case, as you can see. And then 1% here means that uh, there's, with a high degree of confidence, the PSS test rejects, which means that we can interpret this coefficient 1.491 as a, as a long-term coefficient that ties together uh, these long-term inflation expectations and real rates. Yeah. Um, now I'm gonna show you graphically a lot more estimates and they are all gonna be like those in the third column where I basically restrict the coefficient on R star to be equal to one. So I just subtract R star from the real rate on the left-hand side and then run this restricted specification. Yeah. Okay, so Here's uh, with household inflation expectations at different horizons, uh, three month, one year, sorry, this is still exposed real rates at different horizons, three months, one year, seven year forward. For all of those, a strong positive relationship. Uh, we can do the same thing now with ex ante subjective real rates using household inflation expectations to compute the real rates. 
Again, positive relationship, coefficient of around 1.5, so one percentage point higher long-term inflation expectation feeds into, feeds into about 1.5% higher uh, real rates at a one-year, five-year, and also seven-year forward horizon. Okay, and now to illustrate the explanatory power of this additional element that comes from the long-term inflation expectations, uh, what I've done in this chart is basically I've taken R star and I have added an additional part, which I call R pi, which is the component that's explained by the variation in these long-term inflation expectations. Yeah? And as you can see, this is then the blue line. Blue line is R star plus R pi. And you can see this goes quite a long way in explaining the secular dynamics uh, of, of these uh, real interest rates that we see here. Okay. So a few more variations on this. Uh, one thing one can ask is, well, what about professional forecaster inflation expectations to compute the real rates instead of households? So this is what I do here. Um, the coefficient is very similar. So for household expectations, we had about 1.4, 1.5. Here it's about 0.95. Uh, so still in pretty much the same ballpark. And then uh, let me show you some charts from Germany, UK, and Japan. Um, so here's uh, when you do the same thing for Germany, it's strikingly similar to the US. Um, so these are exposed real rates for all of these countries because they don't have survey data for households that goes back long enough in all of these countries to do the same thing what I did in the US. But I can do exposed real rate analysis for all of these. Uh, different countries. Yeah. So just like in the US, there's an incre increasing coefficient as you go to longer horizons from three months to one year to seven year forward. The coefficients are a little bit bigger uh, than in the US, but otherwise it's, it's, uh, it's very similar. This is how our star and our star plus our pi look like in Germany. And keep in mind that the black dash line here is an exposed real rate. So that's gonna be more noisy than the ex ante real rate that I showed you in the, in the chart for the US. But uh, it, it also explains a lot more uh, of that uh, secular change in real rates. Uh, here's the UK. Again, very similar. Uh, increasing coefficients as we go to longer horizons. And the magnitude is very similar to what we see in the US. Here's R star plus R pi for the UK. Um, again, helps a lot more you know, beyond our star, which doesn't have all that much variation here uh, in, the, in the UK, uh, to explain what's going on with real rates. And then the last one is Japan. So Japan, I have a little bit less data. Uh, I, I can only start in 1979, which is a little bit later than in the other countries. And I only have bond yields at that time that go out to three years uh, maturity, so not beyond. Um, but otherwise, the estimates are Quite similar. I don't see an increasing coefficient as you go to longer horizons for Japan, uh, but you know coefficients are around one. It's still quite similar to what we saw in all of these other countries. And here's R star plus R pi for Japan. Again, you can see it helps a lot to explain why real rates were so high in the uh, 1980s and into the early 1990s uh, in the Japan, uh, in Japan relative to R star. Okay. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that I don't have time to discuss in detail, but uh, that, that uh, this model also helps to explain. So for example, there's, there are findings in the literature that short-term nominal rates, they co-move a lot in a way that's hard to understand, you know, with long-term real, real rates. Uh, in my model, this happens because both of these have a component that's related to these long-term inflation expectations that makes them move together. Um, long-term yields are surprisingly sensitive to macro announcements. Again, in my model, this happens because when there's, for example, an inflation announcement coming out, this will affect people's long-term inflation expectations a little bit, and it's gonna affect also the entire term structure of you know, future expected short rates because people's entire term structure of inflation expectations uh, moves around. Yeah. And uh, there's evidence that the decline in long-term yields uh, from the uh, in the 1990s until recently is concentrated on macro announcements preceding FOMC announcements. That sort of thing can also happen in my model if these are the you know, announcements at which people update their views about long-term uh, inflation expectations. All right, 
so let me conclude here. Um, so what I was trying to show you is that through this learning, leaning against inflation experiences channel, monetary policy has a substantial, very persistent effect on real rates. Yeah? And so when you look at secular changes in real rates, it would be wrong to conclude that this all somehow has to be variation in a natural rate. There's this additional monetary policy related component that also contributes to the variation. Okay. If you think about the story I told you, uh, well, it means that once long run inflation expectations are elevated in this model, it will take a lot of effort uh, on the part of monetary policy makers to bring them back down and it will take a, lot, a, lot, a long time. And in some sense, you could say this is the opposite view of what Sarchin was talking about when he was talking about the ends of four famous hyperinflations where he was arguing, well, this can happen very quickly. So is there a contradiction? Not quite. So I think what I'm looking at in this model is kind of normal times when there's no big regime change. What Sarchin was talking about were situations where there was a drastic fiscal policy regime change and so, and so forth, right? And so in those situations, of course, you can get some resetting of expectations, uh, but not in that sort of in, the, in these normal times uh, that I was talking about. Yeah? Um, and so the bottom line is basically monetary policy matters probably more for secular dynamics of real rates uh, than is commonly believed. Thank you very much. The discussant is uh, Falk Mazelis from the ECB. Uh, yeah, thanks um, for allowing me to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, the usual disclaimer applies, so these are my views and not those of the ECB. Um, let me start with a, a quick summary. So there are several contributions. The first one is an update of the learning um, by experience framework um, by uh, Stefan and Ulrike Malmendier. The second one is a New Keynesian model that um, showcases the, the mechanism. Um, the third one, which is probably the main contribution, is the um, econometric analysis on how long-term inflation expectations drive um, uh, secular changes in the real rate, and um, not just in the US, but also in other uh, countries. Uh, and then finally, um, there are several puzzles that he's able to answer. And there's a policy implication, um, which is that actions speak louder than words for central banks. And that's something that I want to um, look at a little bit closer uh, in my discussion. Um, so first of all, I really enjoyed reading the paper. Um, I like the mix of different methods, um, uh, empirical methods, uh, semi-structural models, um, essentially. I think um, Stefan does this really quite well. Um, it's not a simple analysis, but um, it, it's actually, he makes it relatively easy to follow. So, so this is very nice. Um, I think it's very important for the literature to consider departures from rational expectations, especially when it comes to monetary policy making. Um, and in fact, that's something um, that has a long history uh, in um, the macroeconomic literature. Um, I think that Stefan does a good job in connecting um, his contributions to the literature. I think I'd like it if he would go a little bit further um, and actually connect it um, to also more recent strands, um, specifically talking about uh, things like optimal monetary policy. The paper is actually entirely descriptive, it's, it's positive. Um, however, I think um, there are some implications that are relevant, um, and, and we heard them just towards the end of the presentation. So what I'm going to do is um, look a little bit about how we can actually do that and how to operationalize the findings in general um, for monetary policy. So um, the first thing that I'm going to do is essentially replicate what he has shown us on, on the top right. Um, what I'm going to do is actually replicate this um, in the context of the holzen laubach williams model directly. So in a sense, it's a consistent estimate that I want to do. Um, so uh, you see in blue the line from, for the US of the real rate, a uh, real natural rate, which is just um, from essentially from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, and what I do is I take the investment savings equation um, of that model, and inside the real rate gap, I replace the, um, the real rate with the subjective real rate according to the model um, that Stefan has. Um, so the output gap is now uh, driven by a real rate gap that on average is quite a bit lower, and the model has essentially two ways of interpreting this. Either um, there can be uh, a lower um, real rate gap over uh, most of the sample, um, which means that um, the observed output would have to be um, uh, driven more by monetary policy and potential um, output would have actually been much lower. Or alternatively, we would see that um, the natural rate is lower. And when we run this model, 
um, through the same, exactly same data, just with this adjustment, we see that we actually have this red line um, in the top, which is quite a bit lower um, than what you see uh, in the original holzen nauber So here, um, I essentially confirm the results that uh, Stefan has, that the natural rate with this mechanism would be lower. However, I can do this just entirely with inflation expectations. I don't need to change the, the expectations about monetary policy necessarily. Um, now, a few caveats. Um, the holzen dabach williams has famously wide uncertainty bands, so probably this red line is still within the blue line, um, if you looked at those, plus I didn't re-estimate the model. So these are, these are elements that one could think of um, to, then, to then improve and have a consistent um, R star with the mechanism um, that Stefan describes. Uh, secondly, and again supporting his view, is a historical shock decomposition in the, in the two uh, in the middle and the bottom um, charts. Um, what I find is that uh, the rear rate, the, the natural rate is much less driven by the growth component. The secular decline is less driven by the growth component, but instead now by the non-growth component, which is typically a proxy for um, things like demographic change and um, uh, preferences for safe assets. But here it leaves open the possibility that indeed um, it's long run inflation expectations that are also driving um, the natural rate of interest. Um, so next, uh, given the um, interest in, in how monetary policymakers um, would behave given the adjustment in this process, I'm interested in looking at um, monetary policy from an optimal standpoint. Um, this is something that Stefan hasn't done, um, so I simply take his model, so I entirely discard the holzen laubach williams model now. I take the new Keynesian model and they're just a few changes that I make. So one is that I enrich the model with a few more exogenous processes uh, to make it a little bit more realistic. And then I take his monetary policy rule and I replace it with a simple rule and I optimize over um, the parameter governing uh, the reaction to inflation and to the output gap. Um, I do this for uh, the parameters of the, um, the calibrated parameters of the model and then I also vary the behavioral parameters. Uh, so I do this for three different parameters. So for example, in the top chart, um, you see on the horizontal line uh, different values for the constant gain learning parameter. And then on the vertical line, we have the ratio of um, the, the optimal parameter focused on inflation stabilization divided by the optimal parameter focused on um, output stabilization. And what I find is that there's this upward sloping relationship um, which essentially means that a faster updating is associated uh, with a stronger focus on, on inflation stabilization. Now, um, the reason for this, uh, looking at the impulse response functions, which I'm not showing here, is essentially that um, if, if the policymaker is able to affect expectations very quickly, they essentially have um, different channels via which monetary policy can travel. Not just the demand channel in the short term, but also the expectations channel in the long term. Um, alternatively, if there is slow learning, and indeed that's, that's what we see with the calibrated parameter value, Stefan mentioned it, it's 1.6%, uh, uh, which is all the way to the left, um, then we actually have a stronger focus on, on output stabilization because it becomes much less efficient to also stabilize um, uh, in, uh, inflation. Um, so, uh, because yeah, inflation stabilization becomes less potent essentially. Um, I also looked at a change in the other behavioral parameters um, that Stefan described. I don't find any strong results here. Um, so, in fact, there, there are several orders of magnitude lower, uh, so I'm going to skip them here. Um, for my final exercise, um, what I did, did is to look at a, a concrete episode in the data. And in fact, I'm trying to replicate a little bit um, what Stefan did in the model, uh, a, an episode where inflation is rising and the output gap is still opening up further. Um, so what I do is I take this metz vouchers model that is estimated on US data. I adjust it slightly. There's a flatter um, Phillips curve because it's more in line with, uh, for example, the FIB US model um, at the Fed. Um, and for the data period, I essentially choose what um, Governor Kogler showed earlier, uh, the, the, middle, the middle panel. So um, we're starting in, in the late 70s. Uh, the vertical line is where I start my simulations. In black, you see the data that comes directly from the Smets and Routers model for the US. Um, and we see inflation is increasing and um, the output gap is slowly opening up. And the interest rate is also increasing. 
So there are two counterfactuals that I'll show you. The first one um, is the blue line. This is essentially just the smetz wouters model with the usual rational expectations, a little bit of forward guidance dampening, um, which is just standard in this approach. Um, and what we see is that the interest rate does increase, the blue line does increase quite a bit faster than the data. Uh, and as an effect, we see that inflation um, is actually dampened a little bit in the near term. However, at the cost of um, pulling uh, the recession or, or the detrimental effects on economic activity um, quite a bit earlier. On the plus side, um, there, there's actually a closer uh, a return to potential uh, later on. Now for the red line, what I find, which is a counterfactual where I have um, the Smets and Vouters model with the, the channel that um, Stefan proposes, I find that there's actually a lower um, in interest rate. So essentially there's a less restrictive policy response um, with the effect that inflation is more or less exactly the same as in the data, but the output gap is actually now much more close, both in the short term as well as in the medium term. And the explanation here is essentially similar to what um, we saw in the previous exercise. The monetary policymaker is less able to affect inflation um, because there's a channel missing, the inflation expectations channel. And so the, the, if the monetary policymaker um, cares about um, um, activity as well, um, they're, they're going to focus more on output because it's going to more efficiently uh, reduce losses. Um, let me conclude. So I think this is a highly relevant paper. Um, I think it's important to look at the departure from uh, rational expectations. Um, the lower R star is something that I also find in my um, exercises. Uh, it's a little bit different um, than, than what Stefan finds. And regarding the uh, message that we should act against inflation um, rather than um, only communicate against it, um, probably true when you conduct a normative analysis um, what I find, however, is that um, we should actually focus on output uh, more than inflation due, the, due to the higher sacrifice ratio, essentially, in that model. So we should focus on stabilizing output, and in the case of a stagflationary episode, it means that we should have a less restrictive um, optimal policy path than um, otherwise. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Let me start by turning to Stefan to give a chance to respond and then obviously open up the floor in a minute also to those on WebEx. Um, if you have questions, please put them into the chat and we can also read them out. Yeah, yeah I guess I just want to say these are you know, great comments, Falk, so, so thank you very much. Um, especially the question of you know, what's optimal monetary policy in that sort of world is a very natural and very interesting one. And so I absolutely agree that this is where one should go with this. Let me open up for questions. I've got two here first. Let's perhaps collect together three, the three questions that are here. <laughs> Hi, so Laura Gatti, ECB. Um, so I have a quick question about the estimation of the gain um, because you know there's a long literature in macro looking at this type of stuff. And, um, and your number is pretty low compared to, you know, what is usually found in papers that estimate constant gains. So I kind of want to ask, why do you think that is? Um, as well as think about you know, what that means in terms of optimal monetary policy, which is also something that, that is you know, there in this kind of literature. Thanks. So I guess one big difference is that you know, the, the estimate of the gain, in our case, comes from panel data on expectations, right? That's what we target. And uh, some of the gain estimates earlier in the macro literature were busy looking for gains that sort of makes the, the model fit the macro data best, which is very different. It's also you know, different. There's also estimates of gain where people have just looked at the time series of you know, median expectations or something, I guess. Again, that's not what we do. We work with the cross-sectional heterogeneity between age groups. And then the gain that this 1.6% is sort of the implied one that comes for, for the dynamics of the average belief that are implied by this you know, cohort level dynamics, right? And so in that sense, it's very different. Uh, um, that said, I had a, a previous discussion at the NBR, who, uh, Adi Sundaram, who went through the exercise of asking, you know, which value of gain would actually be the one that best, best fits the real interest rate data that I'm analyzing, right? It actually turns out that gain is actually not that different. Um, it's a little bit different, but not very much. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Stefan. Jacek Suda from uh, ECB. 
I, uh, I really like your, the, let's say, the micro and macro part, but I'm trying to figure out how, do, how, can I, how can I square them. So on the one hand, I have the individual cohort inflation, long-run inflation expectation that would come from the AR1 process. Right? They, have a, they have a constant, they have a mean, it's changing over time. With every piece of data, they will revise it. And then you have your aggregate inflation expectations which take the entire economy. So my question is, to what extent they actually are square? I mean, to, watch, uh, to what extent they match each other theoretically? And second, if I would actually construct a long-run gain using the mean estimates of each cohort, and then I would average out across cohort size, I think I would have some effects of demographic changes over time, right? I could do that, and I could also derive the aggregate implied gain for, uh, for the model, taking your micro level data. And then I could ask to what extent the experience in the US matches what's going on in the UK or in Japan, where the demographics is different and possibly the learning experience would be also, th the aggregate one would be different. Yeah, so I think what I'm doing right now sort of works very well, uh, you know, to a very, very good approximation in a world where each cohort, each age group should be weighted equally. Right, and it's, you know, I, I'm forgetting about the short run dynamics, so that part of the AR, AR1 is not there, it's just about the, the long run mean estimates. But in that world where you can equally weight all of these age groups, that works very well. Uh, but you're absolutely right that the world may be more complicated and different groups should get different weights based on demographic change, for example. Um, but there's actually also more, right? You could ask, well, maybe it's consumption shares that matter, maybe for pricing of bonds, it's more like wealth shares that matter. So there's a whole bunch of different questions about how much weight should you give different groups. And this may affect then the gain estimate that you get. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting question, but so far I haven't kind of opened that kind of worms yet. But uh, especially for you know, comparing with countries like Japan that have a very much aging society and so on, these are, I think, very interesting questions. Uh, but, but I haven't done it yet. Let's take two last questions. I think Shebnam and then one at the back and then maybe we'll collect the two questions uh, and then give Ch Stefan a chance to respond. Thanks. Shebnam Kalem Nolskan, Brown University, a fantastic paper. Um, in fact, I have a similar in spirit paper for exchange rates, normal and real. And um, when we are kind of working on that paper and presenting the paper, if we interpret the results as deviation from rational expectations, we realize there is just this huge pushback. So we started saying, or oh, deviation from fire, right? Full information rational expectations, which is of course going to cover a lot of things. So my first question is, is exactly that. You know, how, you also cannot be sure, right? There can be some sort of informational story feeding into the expectation story. Let me give you an example. Imagine you are using market participant expectations here instead of the Michigan uh, survey, right? And we seen since Jackson Hole meeting, I mean, you know, it's like uh, not even two month period if you look at their uh, bets and take out the short-run and long-run expectations, I mean, it's just like like this. In fact, you wouldn't be able to do the exercise with that because it's going to be flip-flopping all around and it wouldn't be sticky. So uh, in that sense, you know, why like, you know, kind of go with certain expectations in the updating exercise and then how that leads to this single interpretation of, you know, deviation from racial expectations, but not just like some, you know, fire deviation. And let's take the last question as well. Thanks. Uh, Frederick Toscani from the IMF. Thanks, super cool stuff. I was wondering, I don't know what the data constraints would be, but if you thought about doing it for a country where real rates haven't really come down, say Brazil, you could even have a sort of, right, that maybe this would explain really well the kind of learning thing you've had elevated or Uruguay, you know, these Latin American countries, where it's in between what you said, this extreme regime change thing and the sort of uh, AEs where we've had this long downward trend. You could even maybe think about a panel dimension at some, some point where you can kind of put it all together. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so let me take the last question first. Uh, and, you know, very short reply. I think it's a great idea. Uh, so, so, I mean, for this whole research agenda, also looking at other countries where there was more, you know, action and inflation, and, and I, I think, yeah, it would be fascinating, would be useful. So. Uh, um, Shabnam, so I guess market-based expectations, you're right, you know, what's going on there in the short term 
sometimes hard to understand. Uh, but you know, in this paper, I'm focusing on secular changes, so I'd be willing to just you know smooth over some of the noise. And once you do that, you know, if you look at let's say 20-year break-even tips, it's actually not that far away from what you get from. There's a little bit of level difference, but in sort of the, you know, the slope that we saw there, um, not that different from what the Michigan survey expectations look like, not that different from what the professional forecaster expectations look like. And so I think once you focus on these secular changes, it's actually not, not uh, um, and um, there was one more thing I wanted to say on this. Um, I guess, yeah, you know, what, about fire deviations, you know, I, I think what has motivated this research and kind of, you know, the, also the agenda that Ulrich and I have, we, we kind of strongly believe that if you want to do fire deviations, we want to ground this in estimates from micro data on expectations or the end or decisions. And so this is sort of driving our, also this is the reason why I, I like to tie my hands to this, you know, gain estimate that comes from micro data rather than just fitting it to the macro data uh, and so forth. So this is sort of our, our philosophy on, on, on that. Okay, well, thank you very much. And let's then turn to the second paper in the session, which is mandatory uh, communication rules to be presented by Amy Handlon from Brown University. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Amy Hanlon from Brown University. Uh, thank you all for staying for the last paper on the program. Uh, and so as the person who's the last you know, speaker, I want to say you know, thank you to all of the organizers in the ECB for hosting all of us. We, it's been a great conference and uh, uh, very much have enjoyed the past couple of days. So uh, as you said, this paper is called Monetary Communication Rules. This is joint work with Laura Gatti, who is at the ECB. And so the normal disclaimer applies. Oh, hold on, these aren't my slides. I gotta say that these, these are Alexander's slides. Can we switch them uh, to the other slides? I mean, it would be an exciting end to the conference for the presenter to present the discussion. So I guess as they're figuring that out, I can just start with talking about kind of the introduction for the, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I, can, I can just do some, some sign language to visualize what the slides are gonna look like. So for this project, monetary communication rules, the way that we are motivated uh, in this paper is we're thinking about this long history in monetary economics for thinking about how interest rates are determined by some sort of policy rule. And going into how that connects between theory and practice, we like to think about Taylor 1993. And there, Taylor talks about policy rules in practice really are actually just systematic policy, more of a statistical object that we can measure in the data, that there's some covariance between the interest rate decision and macroeconomic forecasts and macroeconomic variables, rather than something that's a, a, a pure commitment or strict commitment to Okay, there we go, these are the right slides. Thank you guys. Uh, more than a strict commitment to uh, having to follow an equation, okay? So now we can go to the introduction slide. So uh, this is a quote from Taylor 93, where saying that policy rules, really we should think of them as being systematic policy. That there is uh, an interest rate decision that's not being done randomly or casually, it's being done uh, methodically. Uh, and according to some sense of a plan, and in this paper, Taylor runs regressions to see the correlation between interest rates and macroeconomic variables. He finds a very high R squared, a very good fit for this regression, and concludes that this is evidence of systematic policy. And so we should proceed in modeling uh, interest rates using some formula and seeing that there is some systematic pattern, but not necessarily implying this strict commitment that uh, would come from, uh, you know, it's not necessarily implying some strict commitment. And so in this paper, Laura and I are taking the stance that we want to think about communication from central banks as also being an important policy object. And as a first part in, the, in, in a broader research agenda, thinking about how do we, uh, you know, can we measure in the data systematic communication? So we're going to be looking at covariances between the language in, in particular, FOMC post-meeting announcements. 
and how they relate to contemporaneous policy variables as well as macroeconomic forecasts. Uh, to you know, reveal the surprise at the very beginning, we're gonna find that there is a very strong relationship between the word choice of the Fed and their expectations as well as their contemporaneous policy decision. And so similar to Taylor, we conclude that this is warranting further research and modeling of communication rules. Uh, before I talk in more detail about the paper, I want to highlight why we focus on the FOMC post-meeting announcements. So here, this is uh, something that we really like because it has a nice parallel to how the interest rate is chosen by the FOMC. The language in the FOMC statement is also voted on by the FOMC members. So we see this as similarly a joint institutional policy object. So that's something that we really like about it. Um, but then at the bottom, we can see our question is, can we measure systematic monetary policy communication in the data uh, that we can then use in future research as motivation for trying to think about you know, potentially optimal communication policy? But this paper is really going to be on that descriptive level and motivating a broader agenda. The way that we measure systematic communication is uh, we, we, we first estimate time varying ridge regressions that are going to connect the language in the FOMC statements to contemporaneous policy decisions, as well as internal forecasts uh, on a variety of macroeconomic variables. Uh, this is something that within this bullet point, there's also a big part of the paper where we're making very conscious decisions about how we're quantifying text. So thinking about Language is something that's a very high dimensional complex object. And so as researchers measuring language, we have to take a stance on how we want to measure that and what we're going to be able to, what information we're going to be able to extract. So we'll talk a lot in the presentation about that measurement as well. For tractability, we're going to be looking at different regressions for each forecast and policy variable. So we're going to end up looking at how the text from the FOMC statement is correlating with the contemporaneous target federal funds rate. And that will be a separate regression for thinking about how inflation expectations are co-varying with um, the, the language in the FOMC statement, for example. We call these estimated regressions, monetary communication rules in the paper. But for now, I want you to think of these, are, these regressions are evidence in support of there being this systematic policy, this systematic language. I mentioned that we're, we estimate time varying ridge regressions. And so with that time varying component, we're going to be able to measure when there is a shift in the covariance between uh, language and, and a variety of, of, of policy and, expect, and forecast objects. And what we find is that when there's a shift in how language is co-varying with uh, the contemporaneous interest rate, so thinking about there's a change in forward guidance language, there's a change in how the FOMC wants to justify setting interest rates, this is going to be associated with larger monetary surprises, even after controlling for how the target federal funds rate changed. So this is something that there's the language is affecting how uh, uh, investors are responding to monetary policy announcements. Um, and so going to the practice part of uh, the conference, this is really underscoring what a lot of central bankers already know, is that we should take care in how we're systematically communicating to the public. And this paper is, is saying that we can actually just measure that in the data. For the remainder of the presentation, we're going to first talk about how we're going to measure uh, language. So what numbers are we going to assign to language? We're going to then talk about the regression specification, and then we'll jump into the results. Okay. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to be focusing on the FOMC statement as the main communication object for this paper. Um, it talks about a variety, you know, not only the target interest rate decision, but also covers uh, expectations over the economy uh, and kind of some, and also includes language about, uh, you know, conditions going forward. We're going to connect the language in the FOMC statements to a variety of realized policy variables, as well as internal forecasts from the Green Book and Teal Books. What we're then, for this presentation, we're going to focus primarily on how the target federal funds rate is going to be correlated with the language from the FOMC statements. This is something that conceptually we would expect there to be some systematic word choice justifying how interest rates are changing. We're going to be able to verify that. The other reason that we focus on this in presentations is because we see the target federal funds rate as a summary statistic of all of the FOMC's expectations and forecasts uh, at that meeting. So that's why we're going to focus on it for the presentation, but in the paper uh, we have more detail and a variety of different regressions for thinking about what phrases, what language is going to be correlated with these different objects. Later in the presentation, we'll get to discussing private expectations, and I'll talk more about it there.
Now on to how do we measure text. So uh, on the previous slide, very much indicated we're going to be looking at numerical variables like the target federal funds rate, and how does it correlate with language. So what we need to do is we need to represent language with numbers. So on this slide, we like to, you know, we like to introduce the simplified representation as a warm-up. So we think about if we wanted to take a stance on measuring language, uh, one approach could actually be to use like what, what Christian was using uh, in the presentation yesterday to say there's uh, gonna be some positive words and some negative words and we can count how often those words that the researcher has prescribed meaning to occur. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a stance. We're not gonna take a stance on what words mean. We just wanna think about first, how do we measure patterns in language? And so here in this simplified example, we can think of the different dimensions of text as being all of the different possible words that the FOMC is using in their statement. And then if we wanna have a quantitative representation of a statement, we can count how often each word occurs in each statement. So for example, we can think about word one in our vocabulary. How often does word one occur in statement one? That's gonna be a number that we can put into, into this uh, data set. We can do this for every single word. And then eventually we'll have uh, each statement is represented as a vector of word counts. This is something that this kind of data set is, is a good intuition, but using exactly this has shortcomings. This is something where we're not gonna be able to, if we really looked at each separate word and just counting, we wouldn't be able to keep track of order of words. So it'd be something where if you said inflation is increasing, unemployment is decreasing, would be measured the same as saying inflation is de decreasing, unemployment is increasing. So keeping track of the order of words is very, very important for, for measuring language. Um, and so that's not only the order of words, but how they, how they occur together. And so for our main specification, we're actually gonna have two different approaches that we're gonna use as kind of uh, bookends to thinking about different uh, strengths and weaknesses of different types of measures of text. Um, and this is actually echoes really well to, to Fabian's discussion from yesterday, talking about there's a spectrum of different ways of measuring language. And we're gonna have a, kind of this spectrum as well in this paper. So our first approach we call a clustered four grams approach. What this is gonna be is similar in, in, in some ways to the, the uh, example on the previous slide. We're gonna be counting occurrences of text objects, but it's gonna be of phrases. So we'll have phrases, uh, groups of phrases of four words in a row that we're gonna count how often they occur. This is gonna be something that the different dimensions of text are then going to be represented as um, these different phrases and how often those phrases occur. Um, this will be, you know, we'll see how often there are phrases about removing policy accommodation is one example of a cluster of phrases they're all talking about removing policy accommodation. There's another cluster of phrases that's talking about uh, risks to economic outlook and seeing how often that is discussed in statements. The advantage of this approach is that it's interpretable. We can uh, interpret what the phrase is on that dimension. Uh, and it really is capturing this feature of monetary communication uh, and Fed speak is that people pay a lot of attention to exact word changes. And when you talk to central bankers who are involved in drafting announcements, there's a lot of care put into exact word choices. So this method is gonna highlight exact word, cha uh, word, cha word changes. The downside is that this method is also has a, a shortcoming related to the, the previous slide, where it's not gonna be able to keep track of orders of phrases. So it would keep track that you know, inflation is increasing and unemployment is decreasing, but what the order of that phrase might be something that could matter, and that's gonna be abstracted from in this first approach. The second approach, is using a large language model. So we're here we're going to use an off-the-shelf uh, BERT model. So this is gonna be using uh, a base distill Roberta uh, model. And what this does is we put the entire FOMC statement into this large language model and it's able to spit out a vector that's trained in the computer science literature and this, this latent vector that it produces captures the patterns and the order of words and which words occur. So this is something that is really great because it captures the word order, it captures patterns uh, in the words that are used, but the downside is that it's going to have dimensions that are not gonna be interpretable like the first approach. So saying what is the first dimension of an embedding doesn't have an interpretable meaning. Uh, and then also it's gonna smooth over a little bit of the exact word changes. It's gonna say things like moderate and moderation uh, or, or modest and moderation or, or moderate are gonna be really similar. So those are gonna be closer together in this embedding space. So I wanna talk a little bit more about the details of how we construct these measures before we jump into the regressions, okay? Uh, 
For the clustered four gram approach, what we do is we start with our entire sample of the FOMC statements, and we apply some standard cleaning uh, and processing procedures. So uh, one of the important things I wanna highlight here is we remove numbers from the statements and we remove months from the statements, and we apply some standard language normalization so that language is more comparable across the announcements. Okay, one example of this is instead of using Federal Open Market Committee as four words, we group that together into one entity called FOMC. What we then do is we look at all of the sequences of four words in a row that occur in the FOMC statements, and we do this in a rolling fashion. And then, uh, so in the example here, we see the Federal Open Market Committee decided today to keep its target uh, for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter percent. That would then be in, uh, represented as FOMC decide today keep, decide today keep target, today keep target funds rate, uh, and so on, okay? This produces a lot of different phrases that we would potentially have to keep track of. So we apply a standard procedure from the natural language processing literature and drop really, really rare phrases. In our mind, we're focusing on systematic communication, so we need to look at phrases that are occurring fairly regularly. And this still leaves us with about 700 phrases that we are keeping track of over our sample period. Even then, this is still pretty high dimensionality. So we then further apply uh, a clustering algorithm where we first encode these phrases with a large language model so we can tell how similar two phrases are and we cluster them using agglomerative clustering. And this leads us to having uh, 100 uh, clusters of phrases. So similar phrases end up being grouped together, and then we're gonna count those similar phrases. The major advantage of this is this gives us a dense matrix to work with as opposed to having a matrix that might have a whole bunch of zeros in it. Next, just to highlight the, the large language model approach, here we do a similar uh, processing in the beginning, but even a little bit more hands off. The only thing that we do for affecting the FOMC statements is we remove numbers, as well as removing mentions of months or the date. So this is something that makes it so that the FOMC statements, the words is really what we're focusing on. We're gonna use an off the shelf uh, large language model that's trained to be able to encode everything in the English language. So it should be able to equally able encode uh, in a vector an advertisement for ice cream as it is an FOMC statement, okay? And this leads to a 768 dimension vector. Now, this large language model, because it's able to try and encode so many diverse language or types of documents, we don't need all of that, those dimensions to measure variation between very, very similar FOMC statements over time. So what we do is we do dimension reduction on this application as well, where we apply principal component analysis, and we're able to find that we only really need about 40 dimensions in order to capture 94% of the variation in the Burton beddings, or those, Bur those large language model vector representations. So we're gonna be working with these 40 principal components as our measure of uh, context-dependent uh, language variation. Okay, so now, that's gonna be our two approaches, or two ways of representing language. And we're gonna kind of have parallel graphs and results for, for looking at how they connect with the target federal funds rate over our sample period. When we're gonna be running these regressions, and again, the main thing that we're focusing on is this, is there some convincing covariance between our policy, the interest rate, macro expectations, and the language? Uh, we're gonna need to make some assumptions for running these regressions. So the first assumption is that we need the FOMC statement uh, is a union of messages about a variety of different topics. So the actual FOMC statement has some information about the interest rate, it talks about uh, its expectations in the economy. This is something that anecdotally we can verify by reading FOMC statements. It does talk about the policy decision, it talks about justifying that policy decision with uh, the economic situation. We also, our second assumption is really important is that when anyone ever is running any regression with text, this assumption is being, uh, is being put in place. And it's, you're assuming that the way that you're measuring language is appropriate for capturing the underlying information uh, of that text, okay? So that's gonna be, uh, for us, it's gonna be a linear combination of those different dimensions in text, is an appropriate representation of how we think about patterns in language. The next two uh, assumptions really come down to if we're running a regression over a certain period of time, we get coefficients. Those coefficients are implying that that relationship would be over the sample period, okay? And so moving on to this point five, uh, this is really a tractability assumption. So in an ideal world, if we would think about a Taylor rule, the policy object is on the left-hand side. 
But for tractability with the current method that we have in this paper, uh, we're only going to be able to make, uh, we still have fairly large dimension representation of the language, and so that's going to be on our right-hand side. And we're going to look at separately how that correlates with uh, different policy variables like the target federal funds rate. And so we're going to be having a specification that looks like this. We'll have uh, the policy variable, or in the paper we have also expectations or forecast variables on the left-hand side, and we'll have our measure of text on the right-hand side. Um, what we should take away from this is if there is systematic communication, we're still going to be able to find suggestive evidence of that, that if there is a strong correlation between language and the variety of objects we're studying, this is going to be evidence of systematic communication. Okay. One more thing on the regression specification I want to emphasize is how we're estimating the coefficients. So if it wasn't clear already, Laura and I are very concerned with overfitting. We've been you know, trying to incorporate commas and, and trying to reduce dimensionality every way we can. The next way that we can think about trying to control for overfitting concerns is by having a penalized regression. So this is, what we all, this is the reason why we also apply uh, a ridge regression here. So we have a penalized regression where our penalty parameter is chosen uh, optimally for every subsample that we work with. So we're going to use cross-fold, k-fold uh, cross-validation to select a penalty parameter that gives us the highest out-of-sample accuracy. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about two different specifications. So the first one is going to be suppose that the covariance between language and the target federal funds rate is stable over an entire sample period. What can we learn from that? What can we find from that? Then we're going to look at our time varying specification. Okay. So for now, suppose that you know, when we estimate one regression for our entire sample period, um, are we able to find evidence of systematic communication? And so our interpretation of this is if there is a, a high R squared, if the language is, seems sufficiently correlated with the target federal funds rate, we take that as evidence of systematic communication. And that's exactly what we're able to find. So again, in the language, there's no measure of numbers. So this is not just a purely, there's the number target federal funds rate is in the text and that's what this is picking up. This is based on the language justifying the policy decision is able to predict the policy, uh, uh, the target federal funds rate itself. Um, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the black line is the target federal funds rate and the red dashed line is the fitted value from the representation of text in that clustered four gram approach. On the right-hand side, we have the large language model approach for representing language, and the red dash line there is going to be from, from that model. What we find is that the fitted values uh, are, are very, very closely fit for actually not only the target federal funds rate, but for all the macroeconomic variables I highlight on the da data slide, except for one. We're not able to find uh, a systematic communication bet between the language uh, and the short-run inflation forecast for headline inflation. So this is something that our interpretation is, these are expectations that are moving you know, around a little bit more for short, short run uh, next quarter headline inflation forecasts. And it's something that also the FOMC is not targeting in its policy. The FOMC is targeting more medium run policy and targeting core measures. And so it doesn't make sense for them to communicate something that's exceptionally noisy that they're not even targeting. So for us, that was a little bit of a sanity check uh, that we thought was really, uh, really interesting. Uh, but otherwise, we find fairly systematic um, correlation between the language and uh, the, uh, the target federal funds rate in particular on this slide. In uh, the paper, and we're working on trying to synthesize this into shorter, uh, shorter kind of bits, we are also able to look at the clustered four gram approach. What are the phrases that are indicative of higher rates versus lower rates? And we'll look at some of those word lists later in, in, in the slides. But generally, what we're able to find is for higher rates, it's going to be associated with discussions of uh, you know, stronger labor market conditions and high inflation, whereas lower rates are associated with weaker labor market conditions and, uh, and, and lower inflation. So this is something that it's really the dual mandate is the systematic communication that's kind of coming through uh, in, 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 this, in this part here. Okay. For the sake of time, I'm going to have to skip over our robustness check. That's uh, still pretty exciting, but we do a lot of robustness checks in the paper on you know, different assumptions on the cleaning procedure, on the measurement procedure. We also do another sanity check of you know, what happens if we were to just shuffle the timing of when the FOMC announcements happened. Maybe you know, any measure of language would correlate with the target federal fund rate, uh, and we're not able to find that in, in, in this paper. So it's something about when the Fed is saying what it's saying, that matters. It's the, the covariance of the language at that meeting is, is what really drives this result. Okay. So now to talk about the communication rules over time, 
to put the specification back up, where this is gonna matter is we're gonna be estimating separate betas as well as separate penalty parameters for every single uh, subsample time or smaller time window that we're gonna estimate the data uh, with the data. So we're gonna restrict the sample to a smaller window and then we'll, we'll, we can see what does the in-sample versus out-of-sample fit look like for these regressions. So on the next slide, I'm gonna go through an example of three specific uh, regressions that we run uh, and we'll look at the out-of-sample. And I'm gonna highlight now that the out-of-sample fit is going to be bad. And we're gonna talk about why that is. Okay, so on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, again, it's the clustered four grams approach. On the right-hand side, it's the BERT model approach. And with the green vertical line, that's going to be using the uh, data pre-August 2007 to look at the relationship between language and the target federal funds rate. Then the next regression is looking at the blue vertical line. It's the language and target federal funds rate from two, December 2008 and prior. And then for the August 2011 framework, or, or vertical line, that purple line, is everything to the left is gonna be that in sample and then uh, everything to the right would be that out of sample benchmark. So we've been doing everything ex ante to try and control for overfitting. So that's one reason that can lead to poor out of sample fit, right? That's a logical concern. And so that's why we've been really working hard on trying to prevent that. And at this point, Laura and I are convinced that that's not the story that's happening here. It really is the communication of the Fed is, is, is co-varying with these objects that we can measure in the data. Um, another reason that we can have deterioration of out of sample fit is if the model changes. So this is something that if there is shifts in communication policy or how communication uh, intentionally is varying with policy objects or expectations, that's another reason why you would have poor out of sample fit. Uh, anecdotally, this is something that during this time period, we know that there's a lot of changes to forward guidance policy, a lot of cha changes to the FOMC statement itself, and that's gonna be the interpretation that we're going for, but uh, you know, any other you know, robustness checks for, for, for over, uh, overfitting, we're happy to take those and, and, and throw it at, at, at the paper. We've done a lot already, but we're happy to do more. So here we're thinking about, well, if we think that there's changes in communication, how do we measure that? How do we quantify that? How do we synthesize that information of changes in the systematic uh, communication? Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're going to leverage the changes in the fitted values from one regression we estimate to the next. So we're thinking about the difference in the parameters we estimate from one regression to the next regression. So on the graph on the left, I think is the easiest to get the intuition for what we're gonna do. So if we look at the, the, the August 2007 regression and the December 2008 regression, we can see that their patterns are almost identical. Okay, so in our measure that we're gonna produce, we would say that the communication patterns there are, are pretty similar. There's not really a change in communication strategy between August 2007 and uh, December 2008. However, if we were to, for example, compare August 2007 and August uh, and 2011, there we see that even in the out of sample period that there's different patterns in, that, uh, in, in the variation of, 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 of those fitted values. So there we would say this is uh, statistical evidence that there's a shift in the communication pattern uh, in that interim, okay? To formalize this concept, we produce at the very bottom of this slide what we call the shift indicator. So procedurally, we're going to be estimating an expanding window where we'll start with a, a smallest window going through August 2007, we'll estimate our betas and alphas, then we'll add one more meeting, we'll estimate a new set of betas and alphas, and then we'll compare how uh, similar those two regressions are. Okay? If they're identical, that's gonna mean that the correlation, the correlation is gonna be basically one, so we would have a shift of zero. If we see a big change in the fitted values produced by these two measures, um, when we apply the, each regression to the same sample, then we're gonna see a correlation less than one, which will indicate that there's a shift. Okay. What we're able to see for, uh, on this graph is over this period where we're able to start from the, the, expand, the end of the expanding, or the, the start of the expanding window approach all the way to the end of our sample, so from 2007 in August all the way through 2022, we're able to measure the shift or the, sh the change in these parameters. So a spike uh, here you should interpret as a change in the, that covariance between communication and the target federal funds rate. And I wanna highlight that in both of these there's a little bit of different variation because there are different interpretations of what patterns and language are occurring. But for both of them, the vast majority of language changes are happening during the zero lower bound period. 
So this is something that's not being driven by changes in the target federal funds rate, it's being driven by the corresponding changes in language policy in association with that rate, okay? Um, every time that you see a spike here, that indicates that, uh, yeah, so the spike is something that you think of as a, as a change or something differing in how that, that uh, from that point onward, uh, there's a difference in the communication patterns. Okay. Now, before we go into some of the, uh, how this connects to private sector beliefs, I wanna highlight some of the phrases. So going back to that earlier example, the intuition where we had the August 2011 rule, we would expect to be different from the, the August 2011 rule. Here's why they're different, okay? August 2007 and before, the phrases that are, are really being predictive of higher versus lower rates are discussions about in this kind of brown color, discussions about the labor market. When it's high, there are phrases talking about there's improving or strong labor markets. Uh, and then when there's low uh, target federal funds rate, this is associated with uh, a con balancing between labor market conditions and inflation, or there's weak labor market conditions. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the inflation condition, so thinking about the risk to inflation, what's happening with energy prices is associated with higher target federal funds rate. Where there's differences going into August 2011, we have an introduction of forward guidance language that's very, very explicit. So there's a lot of phrases talking about uh, interest rates are going to remain low. They're going to remain low for some time. Okay. Also, conceptually, those are things that you would hope that the dimensions that are talking about low interest rates should be predictive of low interest rates. So that is something that we find here. The other thing that's introduced is discussions of uh, when there's going to be the end of asset purchasing programs. So even in the early part of the zero lower bound, there's still this signaling of there's when is it going to end is language that gets associated with higher uh, uh, interest rates. Okay. So in the last couple of minutes, I wanna to touch on how does this shift measure that we produced correlate with uh, monetary surprises or, or how much of a response do we get from investors in Fed Fund Futures markets? And so because our shift indicator is something that is just a magnitude, there's a change or there's not a change, we're gonna transform the monetary surprises to also be absolute value. So they're gonna be, there's a bigger surprise or there's a smaller surprise, okay? Uh, we look at a variety of different surprise measures, and just to highlight the results here, we're going to find that when there's shifts in the communication rule, it's associated with larger monetary surprises, but in particular monetary surprises that in ha still have information effects or news response effects. Depending on how you're moving or how you're uh, controlling for discussions of news, uh, you're gonna be able to actually control for effects or surprises to investors that are driven by the communication channel. So here I'm gonna show the regression specification for the BERT um, shift indicator. We dropped 2008, 2000, uh, January 2009, as well as March 2020 as extreme outliers. And we also apply a log transformation and standardize so we can compare our different columns. What we find is that our shift indicator, even after controlling for how the target federal funds rate changed and controlling for time fixed effects, is we find that it's strongly, like it is strongly correlated with the uh, news policy news shock from Nakamura and Steinson. It's strongly correlated with the path factor from Gherkin, Sack and Swanson. Uh, and it's also correlated with the newer Bauer and Swanson measure from prior to the orthogonalization procedure they propose. Um, this is something that I'm, I'm planning on talking more with Marek and, uh, and, and Peter in terms of what's happening here. This is their poor man's or their simplified measure. So there could be some nuance missed between their simplified measure uh, and their full, uh, you know, more nuanced measure. Um, but ultimately what we find is that doing some sort of orthogonalization or here it's a rotation to say, let's focus on the target federal funds rate. Um, those are gonna be important steps for working with high frequency identified monetary shocks. They are affected by communication uh, and changes in the systematic communication. So this is an important uh, finding that we have here is not only we find evidence of systematic communication, at least from our measure, when that systematic communication is changing, it's gonna affect our other measures that we have of, of monetary policy shocks. And so with that, I wanna wrap up by saying, again, this is paper, a paper at the beginning of a research agenda, similar to Taylor 93, that we're saying that, let's just first see if we can find some systematic covariance between language and relevant policy and forecast variables. We do find that systematic relationship. Uh, we find that also private sector beliefs are, are responding to the communication patterns, uh, and uh, we're, we're pretty excited about the, the text analysis discussion as well. So with that, thank you everyone.
So the discussant is Alexander Kolas from the University of Oxford. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much and, uh, for, for inviting me to discuss this uh, thoughtful and, and slightly provocative paper by Laura and Amy on monetary policy communication rules. So the motivation behind the paper can be captured as follows. So in the past three decades, we've seen a steady march towards central bank transparency, accompanied by rich theoretical developments which have allowed us to get a deeper understanding of the normative trade-offs involved in central bank communication. Now, one question one can ask is, you know, how close are we currently to what would be optimal? And in order to do that, we need to have some description of what actually is being done at the moment. And what Laura and Amy do is they propose a kind of a natural language processing me based method to provide the first kind of rule-based characterization of central bank communication that at least I, I have seen. Now, from a broader perspective, and there is a quote often uh, uh, attributed to Ben Bernanke that says that monetary policy is 98% talk and 2% actually actions. Now, this feature, though, is completely absent from standard macroeconomic models. Now, there are several reasons for this. One is uh, quantitative skepticism about the importance of all of this communication. Yeah. The second is that we don't have a way to systematically put this communication into a standard framework. So with the increased availability of these textual analysis methods, there is perhaps the hope that we can provide some simple characterization of all this central bank communication that we then can embed into standard models and hope to analyze their consequences. And this is what really what uh, Laura and Amy do. They show how one can use common, simple machine learning methods combined with transcripts to provide a rule-based characterization of central bank policy that can help unleash this, uh, this constraint we've faced with the analysis of central bank communication. Now, in order to do that, they uh, take uh, FOMC post-meeting uh, transcripts data and a bunch of outcome variables, like expected expectations of future output, inflation, interest rates, uh, unemployment, the money supply, and so on. But crucially, they treat this FOMC text as a, as a bag of words approach, right? So text is just a combination of words. The ordering doesn't really matter. But we're going to weight sequences of words relatively to how frequent they appear in these FOMC transcripts. You then need to make a lot of choices, right? How do you deal with negations, numbers, abbreviations, and so on? And ultimately, there is some trade-off between how granular just your description of these transcripts are and how comprehensible they are to the outside reader. So one needs to make a lot of choices, and there is always this trade-off between granularity and comprehensibility. But once you've done this, you have your sequences of words, you have them weighted, you can then look at how well does these, these n-grams actually correlate with macroeconomic outcomes. So you can write a representation like this, where you just have a regression. You have an outcome variable, yt. And you can regress them on these, uh, these quadgrams, these uh, four sequences of words that you've combined. Now, if you do this, you know, in the baseline analysis, there are roughly 750 of these quadgrams. But for some observations, like GDP, you maybe only have 100 observations. Okay? So you need to seriously do some dimension reductions. And what they do is at different stages, they try to reduce the dimensionality. But one thing you can do, which is a very simple approach, is you can go to the original kind of dimension reduction techniques, which is this uh, Tenkona of regularization, right? uh, ridge regressions. Okay? So to, in order to estimate the coefficients on these quadgrams, you will run these kind of ridge style regressions that depend on these penalty parameters alpha, which measure how strongly you penalize for including an additional term into your description of it. Now, you need to choose this alpha parameter, and what they do is they do this k-full cross-validation, and then given the choice of alpha, you can then estimate the beta, and that will then give you some model fit that you then can compare to realized outcomes. Now, if you then compare the predicted outcome to the realized outcome, you will notice that there is almost an incredibly, there is an incredibly close match between the two. Okay? So on the left-hand side here, you will see the match between the predicted federal funds rate and the target federal funds rate from this simple ridge regression. And on the right-hand side, you will see it for real GDP growth one year ahead. Okay? Now, this fit is incredibly strong, right? Like, it's a very close fit, and it's over a very long sample. Okay? So it looks like communication rules are very stable. Okay? And in fact, if you try to do this in a time-varying manner, with the exception of something around during the Great Recession, you also see that these communication rules have remained remarkably stable over very long periods of time. Now then you can start thinking, you know, 
these little wiggles we see around the Great Recession, do they have some economic implications? And you know, they do have some. They look a little bit like there maybe could be some, some that these shifts in communication maybe slightly work as monetary policy surprises, or at least they lead to additional dispersion in forecasts. Okay? Maybe shifts in communication slightly lead to confusion among private sector agents, and, help, and hence uh, that leads to some dispersion in their economic forecasts. But um, let me now turn to some, some consequences. Right? But, but overall, this paper is, a, is comprehensive in its ambition and its scope. It wants to provide a systematic description of central bank communication, but it's also slightly more than just descriptive economics. Right? We want to raise the bar to assess how far are we from some notion of optimal. Okay? So let me now just turn to, to three comments. Okay? The first comment is that there's this quote often like a misattributed to Bismarck, is that data is like sausages. It's best not to see how it's made. Right? And like with any data set, language, you will need to make a lot of assumptions at each level of the analysis about what exactly to do. One important choice you have to do here is you have to look at whether you want to analyze each variable, say GDP, and how it correlates with the language, and then analyze how inflation correlates with language, whether you want to do this analysis variable by variable, or whether you want to do it in a multivariate case. Okay? Now, in a way, there's a simplicity versus usefulness trade-off, I think. Okay, so on the one hand, the variable by variable approach is more simple to operationalize, but from a theoretical perspective, central bank communication should be some mapping between words and what we believe about the shocks that hit the economy. Like, are they efficient or inefficient disturbances? Are they demand or supply shocks? How large are they? And in order to really operationalize this, you would need like a multivariate analysis. Right? You would at least need to see how people's beliefs, central bank beliefs about inflation and output co-move. And, and ultimately, we all know that it's very important to provide, uh, uh, to lay down theories which are consistent with data, but I believe it's also equally important to lay down data which is actually consistent with the theory that we have. Okay. The second thing is on, on the mode of communication. So from like an outside observer, we see these central banks and they communicate a lot, they talk a lot, and ultimately what they're hoping to do is to move allocations. But allocations just depend upon expectations, so why don't we just directly report the expectations and don't bother with all of this communication? And one thing I think this framework could be used for, which it's not at the moment, is to see whether these words actually have predictive content above the words. Like, can we do more with the words than we could do just in terms of the expectations? Because right? ultimately what we want to do is we want to move allocations, and we could see whether that's actually the case. And then finally, uh, you know, this descriptive analysis is one step towards some sort of normative assessment of, uh, of central bank communication. And the first time I saw this like stability, I was quite surprised, right? Because the theoretical advances of how we should be communicating have changed quite a lot over the past two decades, but it seems the way that actual communication is done has been remarkably stable. Now, there are two reasons why this could do, right? One, one could be like there's been limited pass-through of this research into actual practice, or there are non-welfare-related issues related to communication. The other is simply that, that the difference between how it's actually done and the implications under optimal communication, that there are just quantitative limits. Maybe these effect sizes aren't very large. Okay. And ultimately, what, what was slightly confusing for me about the paper was it wasn't really clear how I would use this to discipline some model to think about whether the costs of central bank communication at the moment outweigh the benefits or vice versa, like how exactly should we use this to actually discipline a model? Okay. So to conclude, considerable effort has been devoted to produce theories about when and how much to disclose of central bank information. And Laurie and Amy comprehensively show us how to measure what is currently done. And it's one step into allowing us for an improved uh, assessment of central bank communication. And then finally, as in John Taylor's work, which I think must have made central bankers slightly nervous that we could just automate their jobs, uh, this here should make you slightly nervous if you're in the communication department of the ECB because they effectively automated your job. So thank you. Thank you for your time and attention. Let me pass back to Amy to respond first, and then we can take questions. Excellent. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, for the for the for the great comments. Uh, and I also have to like give a full disclosure that the draft that we have loaded is not doesn't have some of the updates that we presented in the slides. And so uh, I think that your comments still go through and still apply. And so I, I, I thank you for for being patient with us, and and thank you for the comments. So the the the, the first thing that I, I really wanted to touch on is kind of both your kind of like ending remark uh, about the, the automation of communication generation as well as thinking about uh, the multivariate com uh, you know, 
suggestion that you gave. We absolutely agree that having something where, you know, logically we would want to have the policy object on the left hand side and then we'd want to have all of the different variables that matter for it going on the right hand side. Now we're finally at a point where generative uh, text models are, are sufficiently nuanced to be able to pick up patterns. So that's kind of the last extension for the paper that, that we're going to have. That's going to be uh, that we have some initial results that uh, we're not ready for, for, for the presentation today. But there, that's something where you can start doing this analysis, right, of saying uh, exactly as, as, as you presented, uh, you know, if there's uh, dramatic fluctuations in certain expectations, how is that showing up in variation in the language uh, based on the training sample that we're working with? So that's going to be something that will be able to take into, uh, into the, the, the next revision of the draft. So uh, completely ag agree with that comment. Uh, the second point that I wanted to, 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 to follow up on is how do we think about taking these measures and connecting them to optimal communication or connecting them to, to structural models? Uh, Laura and I have a follow-up paper where we're uh, trying to address that question. So we realized that that was a little much to put all into one paper, but we can include better language on, on how we see that going forward. But uh, just as a highlight, we can think about using uh, measures of language to do things like approximate information pass through, uh, to uh, approximate message spaces, so thinking about precision of messages, are we just releasing, should we just release numbers or should we release these kind of more noisy signals of expectations that's coming from the language? Uh, and so it, the, the highlight from our other work is that uh, something, you know, it's still valuable for the central bank to provide announcements, but providing too precise of information actually can lead to some unintended consequences um, where it might be hard to maintain reputation of being a good forecaster. Um, so this is something that uh, we're, we're following up in, in another work, but, but we absolutely agree that we, this is something that is, is early stage uh, in, in that research agenda. And so I, I, I think that we can help clarify some avenues for future research going forward. But thank you so much. Thanks. Let's open up the floor. And also for those on WebEx, please feel free to put questions in the chat. Uh, let's, let's have this Bernard. Yes, thank you. Bernard Winkler from the ECB. Um, so this is a lot of work, sorry, <laughs> a lot of words to confirm that uh, what central banks say has something to do with what we do. <laughs> so nice, thank you very much. Um, my questions are, um, you're looking at the FOMC statement, uh, so can we be more parsimonious in communication? So you did not mention the dot plot. That's one way to summarize information and markets react a lot to dot plots. Um, so that's a nice, could be a benchmark to say what is in the communication language, which is over and above the dot plot. Mm -hmm. uh, the other direction, you could go to the, to the FMC minutes, which is more comprehensive, extensive, with nuance and detail. So what are we missing when we just look at the FMC statement, which is the consensus, but not uh, the full range of the committee views? And the second question I had, Taylor in 93, that was in the dark ages, if you like. Um, the FOMC did not even publish, I think, the, the interest rate decision and let alone an FOMC statement. So why don't you compare uh, <laughs> to the dark ages? So when there was no statement uh, and markets did not have anything to go by, just speeches, I guess, and maybe Greenspan talking to some journalists uh, uh, the week before the meeting. So that would be really powerful to say uh, the words matter uh, above action. And I'm not convinced by the 98% to 2% ratio. So there is still a hunch, many of us uh, central bankers, to say, look, action speaks louder than words. Uh, so uh, these are two ideas for your next paper, I guess. Thank you. Let's maybe just collect two questions and then, and then, and then two more on the side. So let's take one at the front and then we'll, Amy, then we'll take the next two. So just um, out of curiosity, do you have a view of who is the receiver of this communication? Um, is it the computer that just going to hear uh, the speech and take investment decision? Or more humans that may have, you know, a different model uh, that um, might care about the rhythm of the sentence, whether words rhyme and, and more refined, uh, you know, uh, yeah. aspects. Thanks. Yeah. Why don't you take those two and then we'll take two. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'll respond to this one first and then we'll I'll hopefully try to remember uh, all, all of the questions from before as well. So 
uh, I mean, obviously earlier in the sample period, it's all human-based is, is how people are responding. In more recent times, there is this introduction of not only large language, so of large language models, but even things like word counting approaches. So if you look at the Wall Street Journal in particular, every FOMC meeting, they produce a, here is the difference between the last FOMC statement and this FOMC statement. They highlight the words that have changed. So that's, that could be similar to the word count approach. Um, and so that's something that is really highlighted. Um, I think that there's still, you know, I'd have to, you know, confirm with, you know, hedge funds. I don't think they'd want to just, you know, release all of their secrets. But my understanding is that when money is involved, there's still going to be that human verification that's going to be an important part. So thinking about this is just another source of information and synthesis that can be used to more efficiently trade based on that information. So I think that these algorithms can be used as a way of speeding up that process. Um, and so I think also, I mean, we really don't talk too much besides that suggestive regression at the end about responses. We realize to do something more, uh, more rigorous and more causal, we need to have a, a, a more sophisticated dynamic model uh, that also requires some, some more complicated assumptions on about dimension reduction in language. But same questions that we had about like, well, what does that mean? Or what are they responsive to? Um, and, and, and so that's something that's on, our, uh, on the horizon uh, for us. Okay, and so then for the, the questions uh, from earlier, so the, the, the second question about doing kind of a, a comparison of during the, the dark ages versus now, pre-communication versus now, I think the difficult part would be needing to have some, uh, like what was, you know, if we had some baseline that's consist that's information provided over that entire sample, something like seeing how newspapers are covering uh, over that entire sample period, and then we could do some sort of value-added uh, kind of comparison with the introduction of new modes of communication or new pieces of information. So that's something that we'd have to do kind of a broader uh, kind of scope on what is all of the information and then what is the additional information. Um, so I think that would be uh, probably out of the scope of this paper, but I think that's something we can start thinking on for, for future projects. For your first question about com having a benchmark of the dot plot, the SEP, relative to the announcement, there's, I think, two really important things that we have um, we've been discussing for, for that other project, that, that follow-up project Laura and I are working on, is how do we think about the dot plot uh, as, an informa as information relative to the language in the announcement? I think that's precisely, the dot plot is a more precise announcement or con conveyance of information, whereas the forward guidance in most of the FOMC statements and most uh, central bank language is much more, uh, much more opaque, much, much more general. And so if we were to think about this as like, there's the wider confidence intervals of what's being signaled using words compared to what's being presented in the dot plot. And so uh, we still have to do like a full quantitative analysis, but our, our goal for that paper is to have exactly this kind of question of, should we still have the, the dot plot? What kind of, of advantages, uh, disadvantages are coming along with releasing very precise information relative to, to, to working only in language? Um, so so we, we have very, very similar questions. Um, uh, but thank you so much. So I think there were two questions on this side and we'll, we then should stop. So Leia, um, was there a second one? Yeah, okay, Leia first. Thanks a lot. I think it was a super inspiring talk that, that sparks a lot of uh, questions uh, and, and thoughts. So I actually also have two questions. So a lot of times you, you feel that there's a kind of also like a shifting sentiment and that there may be like a foreshadowing. So have you actually tried also to predict future decisions with like language from before the meetings? Um, and then if I understood correctly, um, you were only looking at the press releases, and I guess it's it's much more uh, easy to uh, edit the statements. So there's much more easy to have the systematic component, but a lot of action also comes from the conference. So I think it would be also really interesting to to see what what happens if you if you look at the uh, yeah, conferences. Thanks a lot. And then last question at the front here. Thanks. Thank you, Fabrizio Venditti from Bank of Italy. Um, I was wondering if targeting the federal funds rate as a left hand side variable is you know, the most interesting question you can address with your machine or with the whole thing you have, because on the one hand, you see it also in your regressions, that's a very narrow um, measure of what monetary policy is, so what the zero power monetary policy becomes many other things, and then that shows up as a lot of uh, action in your, uh, in your model. And the other question I had is, another thing you could do, for example, is trying to understand whether through communications, we can learn something about the shift in what we call the Taylor rules. So in a sense, a break in the Taylor or a shift in the Taylor rule would show up if I had to fit the Taylor rule as a break in the parameters. So in that case, you would be trying to fit uh, 
the residual of these very simple tail rules, which we call shocks, but instead it could just be a shift in, for example, the aggressiveness of central bank towards inflation, and you could be explaining that uh, with your uh, language models. And I think it would, be, it would be very interesting to learn how central banks communicate this, because we don't know the, the rules and how we perceive that kind of change. Thank you. Excellent. So I'll, again, I'll do kind of the reverse order, I think. Uh, so, um, so I think for thinking about shifts in like a you know, true Taylor rule, thinking about is there shifts in parameters or shifts in expectations, uh, I think in a sense that's implicitly kind of what we are seeing is being picked up. When are they justifying high rates versus low rates and kind of like those phrases examples? I think we could probably take that a little bit more seriously to think about, uh, you know, the more recent we had a, in, in the past we had a discussant, uh, Adi Sundaram, talk about the perceived communication rules paper that he has and thinking about the perception of communication, or not per communication rules, the perceived uh, uh, t uh, Taylor rules, thinking about how do people change their expectations on those coefficients? And, and communication could be definitely one of those avenues. So I think borrowing from some of their estimates, I think we can probably do a more uh, concrete analysis of that. Uh, at this point, we don't have that yet, but I think that there is definitely a connection. Um, the, I think you had a first question that I, I don't remember what it was. We can talk, we can also talk more, more okay. Excellent. Uh, and so then for the questions about looking at the press conferences, uh, in addition to looking at the statements, I mean, we can also extend this to talking about uh, the intermeeting communication, uh, talking about, you know, there's, I mean, broader work talking about the importance of these different types of communication, at least for the specification we have so far, what we really need is to have some connection between um, what's going, you know, some kind of like connection between that object of like either the target rate or expectations or forecasts. Here we're using Green Book forecast, which is not exactly the FOMC's forecast. It's the, the Federal Reserve System's forecast that are produced. So that's why we wanted to stick with that like formal consensus text. Um, what would be nice is if we had something that was, for example, connected to the chair's specific expectations, and then we can connect that to how the press conference Q&A is going. Or we could do some other analysis of thinking about the press conference and how the back and forth is, is potentially changing the dialogue or changing the kind of overall signal that's going to markets. But that would require, I think, a little bit more of, a, uh, of an advanced language model to handle that back and forth and evolution of kind of a, a latent state of what is the expectation induced by an announcement and how is that changing over time. But that's something that I think is incredibly, incredibly exciting. And, and I think that you know, there's room for that in the literature because that's very much a question of how much is information is coming from the statement, from the reading of the statement, from the voice of the chair when they're reading the statement, from the Q&As and what types of questions the uh, reporters are asking versus not asking. So I, I think that there's a ton of research questions in that space that are of concern to policymakers as well as investors and uh, for people studying communication. Um, and so I think that this is something that we hope is you know, exciting and inspiring on that dimension. Um, I think there was another question that you had that I, that I don't remember. Forecastability, yes. So we haven't done it in a very, uh, in a, uh, um, in, in, in a super systematic way, we've done something where we're trying to forecast next year interest rates, um, which is a little far in advance. But this is something that is on our to-do list to look at. You know, next meeting, saying let's take uh, let's take some lags and do more of a time series forecasting approach. So that's on our to-do list, but we don't have it yet. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks very much. Let's give um, all of the speakers to discuss a round of applause. Uh, thanks for staying until uh, the very last session. Uh, and as, the, as we come to the end of the conference, let me take a moment to thank, first of all, the, the uh, other members of the organizing committee who I will ask to join me on stage, Roberto Motto, Oreste Tristani, Sujit, Kapadia, and Wolfgang Lemke, please, if you can join me, thanks. And in fact, over the last uh, two uh, days, we have been exposed to great research. So thanks to all the speakers uh, that have traveled from very far away to join here, but also to the online participant. We also this year have uh, registered hundreds of uh, people uh, that, co that connected uh, uh, online. So this is a great success for us that we will be certainly uh, again, using this technology in the future. 
uh, events. Uh, but of course, these big events, as many people behind the scene, and there are many people to to thanks. So I would start with uh, our interns, that uh, are the ones that have uh, volunteered, quote unquote, to <laughs> to handle the microphone. Uh, and these are people that work with us. And uh, uh, maybe I'll call them on the stage: Joanna Ciceo, Zoe Udin, Ricardo von Balzen, and uh, Florian Altman. If you can join, also thanks. A And, and I guess the best uh, we could wish for you is that uh, uh, one time you will be here presenting your own research and work. So to uh, give your um, also your thought on this, uh, your your impact on this um, on this conference, uh, but also many other people, including uh, uh, Anastasia Shnitova and Angeliki Vassala, who are the uh, assistant that have been uh, dealing with all the uh, communication with the external speaker, but also DG communication, uh, multimedia, new newsroom, Nasser, Stefan, Isabel, Anya, Adrian. So thanks a lot to all of you. And again, uh, probably let's uh, uh, keep this collaborative spirit. We hope that we'll translate all this we have seen into uh, further research, additional research, but also hopefully uh, policy action. Uh, and with this, uh, uh, we look forward to see you here next year for uh, the eighth edition. And safe travel and uh, goodbye to all of you. And uh, for those of you who are here, we have now a lunch in the uh, foyer outside. Thanks a lot. Thank you.